Well, good morning and thank you, Maria and Patrick, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me to speak today. I'll be talking about, I've been asked to be talk, talk about our progress over the years in lentivirus mediated gene transfer and the potential of using stem cells for long term correction in cystic fibrosis airway disease. My disclosures cover the usual um, research funding bodies and also I hold shares and receive some compensation from 40X, a company uh, developing some novel lung imaging systems. So the cystic fibrosis and airway disease story, John Engelhart's very nicely saved me a few slides here. So really I'm just going to touch on the fact that, you know, CF, for those of you who don't know about it, is a dreadful disease. It covers so many organ systems. The ones we're really interested in is lung disease. It causes about 95% of the early mortality and most of the poor quality of life. And so that's why there's a lot of focus on it. The CFTR dysfunction is, here's another picture with the same story. It basically says it's about dehydration of the airway surface, the production and sticking and slow clearance or no clearance of mucus and subsequent uh, infection inflammation due to viruses, particles, um, fungi and bacteria. We all are aware, I think certainly in the CF field, of a revolutionary effects of the modulator therapies, particularly those from Vertex, that have come up in the last um, five years. And it's interesting, I'm not going to go through the details of all these mutation classes, interesting just to see where they're effective at the moment. and to note that there's one group where no protein is produced in uh, airway cells that can't be dealt with by modulator therapies. And this is firstly the place where gene addition therapy can work best. And indeed gene addition therapy can work for all of these classes because we're really just trying to put in a correct functioning gene of CFTR to take over whatever function is missing. So the relevant conducting airway cells are broadly split in, uh, into terminally differentiated cells and airway stem cells. And I say conducting airway cells because the pathophysiology of CF is about the conducting airways, not really uh, about the distal airways. So that's where the focus is today. The terminally differentiated cells, you can see here the purple ones, ciliated cells, and also the submucosal glands, up until recently considered the two main sources um, of CFTR expression or lack of expression. Uh, at the very bottom there you can see, and John has mentioned this already, the uh, newly discovered presence of ionocytes which have enormous amounts of CFTR expression and these, as he said, are likely to be a focus of future uh, gene addition therapy uh, uh, studies. The ones of interest today are the OA stem cells, shown, most of them shown there as a subset of basal cells that have particular surface markers that allow them to be uh, detected in the airway. So gene addition therapy at its basis is something that's going to make a difference to this cascade of problems in CF that are treated symptomatically primarily. So you can see all the way down to the bottom there where lung transplant is the only viable option. We can see over a lifetime a nice clear airway and a beautiful conducting, a, a beautiful uh, gas exchange region turns very slowly into an obstructed airway with a loss of uh, conducting, uh, sorry, a loss of gas exchange um, around it. If we have a, a vector carrying our CFTR, the idea is that you go in to the defective cells and you remove all of the other problems. Now that's a great theory. The challenge is to turn it into practice. And the field has been working on this for about 25 years and we're still going because I think the potential here is really enormous. In Adelaide, we created a vector. It was created by Don Anson, who's unfortunately no longer in the field, way back in the late uh, 90s, an HIV-based vector. But we chose a lentivirus vector for these studies and for this process because it has features we, we really wanted. It transduces all cell types. It can be pseudotyped so that, if needed, you can go to particular cell types. It has little immune response. And importantly, it integrates the gene into the cell chromosome. So there's the potential for longevity, and I'll talk about that shortly. Our vector is an HIV-1 base vector with a VSVG pseudotype, so it has a broad tropism in the airway. 
EF1 alpha promoter and we now have an epitope on CFTR so that we can track it well. Uh, most of the people who work in this area know that the CFTR antibodies are notoriously unreliable so that we're pleased to be able to have a, an opportunity to really find this, uh, find where we put the CFTR expression in the airways. So we have developed what we call a standard lentiviral vector delivery process and we designed it specifically to attempt to target stem cells no matter what else we did. And it's a two-step process. Airway conditioning first, followed by gene vector delivery later. The airway conditioning is done with a compound called LPC. That's lysophosphatidylcholine. And that's a small fraction of normal airway surfactant. It's got a, a slight detergent-like effect. And we believe that that causes transient tight junction opening between those airway cells that allows access to the deeper lying receptors. That's important in this situation because the apical surface cells, the ones at the, uh, on the surface of the airway, the receptors for VSVG are below the tight junctions and also the basal cells have those receptors too. So we have a double possibility here to both get the terminally differentiated cells and also target the stem cells deep in the basal cell layer. The LV vector delivery occurs one hour after that conditioning and we've done a number of studies that shown uh, that gives us the best uh, transduction effectiveness. If it comes too close to the LPC, the LPC affects the virus. It's, they're not very strong viruses, uh, quite different to adenovirus and AAV. And so we need to take care there, unfortunately. So we get robust uh, reporter gene expression, starting back from Maria Limberis's paper in 2002 here. You can see a piece of nasal airway of a mouse that's been exposed to LV lax -Z and this fine speckled stipal pattern of individual cells transduced with uh, lax -Z. It's also effective in the lung in the mouse and you can see an example there in the conducting airways. The thing that's important for us is to look at how we can get long-term transduction. Most of us uh, who work in this area can get short-term, that's not an issue. But for a genetic disease like CF, it's a lifelong disease, we need a treatment that's going to work for a lifetime. This is uh, data that came from a long-term study of knockout UNC mice performed by Tris Malewski uh, and reported in 2014. This was a study where we did a single nasal lenti luck dose and it was also, it was actually a physical mixture of lenti luck and lenti CFTR, so you'll see the CFTR data later. But what you can see is in the first and I think I can get that, week, month and three months, really robust, intense nasal gene expression that was lost by about six months out here. And one thing that we hadn't really expected but is shown here is that we're also getting gene expression in the lung. Now that, this, pro, this uh, study design was optimised for nasal delivery but of course the nose is connected to the lung we didn't really expect to see much, but in fact we had uh, a reasonable amount of gene expression early, but then it disappeared quite quickly, but it re-emerged about 12 months later and continued on right to the end in this animal. We, dis we considered that was consistent with the idea that we were having stem cell transfer of the luck gene from basal cells that had been transduced into their progeny. Maria mentioned that people typically think the tel cell turnover time in the airways is three to six months somewhere there in the upper airways. So this all makes sense. When we look at the other aspect of that delivery, the LVCFTR, looking at the detail of the nasal PDs, we have the untreated level here in CF knockouts and the target level in wild types. And you can see after a single dose over this same time period, we're getting roughly half correction to our target level, out to about 12 months, and then by 15 months we're not really seeing a statistical difference, and that's mostly due to the fact that we didn't expect the animals to last that long, and we didn't have enough to start with, which is a real shame, and we've actually tried a couple of times to get funding to repeat this study to do it with adequate numbers uh, and power it properly, but we've been, been unsuccessful, unfortunately, so this is what we've got. However, fairly clear that we've had long-term gene expression. And again, if we're going out to 12 or 15 months, perhaps, 
there's the indication there that we've been hitting airway basal stem cells and that they're populating their progeny with uh, automatic gene correction, essentially. We also were surprised to find that we had improved survival. Now, remember, this was a nasal delivery, so we, we can't really say where that survival, what's the mechanism for that survival, but it was present. And you can see in the dark blue line our treatment group compared to the uh, green and the other dotted line are clearly significantly different. So we're, we're greatly um, encouraged by this result, of course. Now, one of the questions is, does this work in mice and not elsewhere? Well, over the years we've done a number of studies that show in mice, sheep, ferret, and also in marmosets that we have certainly at least initial gene transduction without a problem. So it's not going to be a mouse-specific thing that fails to go any further, we think. The marmoset uh, study is important because that's uh, a primate lung, a non-human primate, and it gets us about as close as we're likely to get to something that's going to say this is likely to be clinically useful. So the question that we come to is, is the extended gene expression, whether reporter genes or CFTR gene expression due to stem cell transduction in the airway? So we designed an experiment to ask that question, does our method actually transduce basal cells? And there's a method that's been used um, to really turn on stem cell cycling and it's the use of the polydocanol or PDOC cell ablation model. And this is a synthetic detergent that's used at a particular concentration in the airway to essentially remove all surface cells but leave that layer of basal cells on the bottom. A subset of that basal cells is where our stem cells are hiding. And the hypothesis from that is if the basal cells are transduced then they should produce clonal outgrowths of, for reported gene, laxate expressing cells after polydocanol treatment. And what we should be seeing with polydocanol treatment is that essentially going from a random pattern, a speckled pattern of gene expression, if you turn on a transduced stem cell, it will give you a clonal outgrowth. You'll get basically clusters. And as a result of that, as the stem cell repopulates the different cell lineages, those cell lineages should also carry the gene that the basal stem cell was transduced with. So the study design, I'll step you through this. We had four groups in this uh, study. Firstly, every one of the groups was given our standard dosing to begin with. One group was looked at, and these were time kills, at one week. And this shows the transduction of all the terminally differentiated cells. So you have that fine speckling, they're individual cells that have been transduced. A second group was given the standard dosing and simply taken out to 14 weeks to see what was there. And although unfortunately you can't see it well in this image, we have both clonal clusters and we also have fine stipling of individual cells still out there at 14 weeks. Third group had the a, po a single polydocanol ablation at four weeks after the initial dose. And I think you can see a difference between here and here. A loss of most of the fine stipled cells, the individually transduced cells that are terminally differentiated surface cells, and an increase in that strong clonal uh, outgrowth. And the last group, similarly, initial transduction, but two of these ablation processes designed to really remove any chance that there was a number of the initial terminally differentiated cells lasting all the way to the end. And I think you can also see that we've got none of this type of uh, individual cell transduction, but a number of clonal outgrowths. And interestingly, we have the circular, the round outgrowths, but we also have linear ones, and I will show you that here in more detail. So you can see that finely speckled expression in the one weeker, taken out to 14 weeks in here, very um, strong clonal growths and individual cells there, but with the polydocanol treatments, very strong clonal clusters as well as lines. Now, if anyone can help me with why you would get uh, lines of clonal growth, we'd love to talk to you. One possibility is that it's just where the vector 
initially transduced perhaps in a mucociliary transit track. That's one possibility, but we, we would love to uh, try to understand that better. We also found in this group that goblet cells were found transduced 14 weeks out. Now, our vector rarely transduces goblet cells uh, early on, acutely. So this is further evidence to us that we have had stem cells transduced and that they have then, in their progeny, one line of which was the goblet cell, produced transduced uh, goblet cells. A separate study done exactly the same way was done in mouse trachea. This is unpublished work at the moment, but we had the same layout. And you can see, perhaps not as clearly, but the same findings. One week we had just transduced cells in the, surf, in the uh, surface cells, but when we go to the polydocrinal ablation, whether once or twice, you can see that we're ending up with simply clonal outgrowths, and they're both circular or linear. So the outcomes from that study told us, in summary, that historically we do get persisting gene expression for much longer than the turnover time that people think uh, is in place in the airway. The clonal appearance of long-term transduced airway cells is there in nasal airway and lung airway. And we had the emergence of transduced goblet cells, which are all consistent with the idea that we're, we are transducing airway stem cells and that they are producing subsequent long-term expression in the progeny. And it also finally validates the potential for this type of stem cell targeted gene addition treatment for CF lung disease. So at that point, I'm just going to switch direction now to where I think future developments are going to go or need to go. And I think it broadly goes into three areas. Firstly, appropriate animal models. And uh, John has uh, very nicely spoken about some of the issues there in the first session. We need models that allow us to look at prevention, to look at halting or reversing disease, to look at long-lived effects, and also to look at redosing. The control of airway vector delivery is going to be crucial. Knowing where the dose goes, the, the nose or the lung should not be black boxes, but right now they are. We throw dose in and hope it sticks and then go and see what we get at the end. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, shortly. We also need to know where vector goes so that we can reduce off-target effects and also reduce wastage. These are expensive vectors, even um, at, at a mouse level. And relevant outcome measures. This is something that I'm particularly interested in. All of our current methods for measuring lung function, which is really what we're talking about, if you ask a person with CF what do they want to find different after treatment, it's how they breathe. It's not whether they've got CFTR in certain cells or mRNA levels. They want to know what is the difference in my airflow. And I'll show you a little bit about that shortly. I should, I guess, also mention that all of our lung function met methods, whether it's for mice or for humans, are really quite ancient. They all started way back in the late um, 1800s, spirometry, x-rays and so on. And they've progressed really quite well, but they're a limited method at the moment, and I think it's time for a change. So we decided to create a CF rat model. There was a reason for that is that we wanted to create a 508 model, an animal with uh, mild disease, purposely mild disease, so that we could then play with all of those different therapeutic strategies, prevention, halting, uh, redosing, and so on. The ferrets, pigs, sheep, rabbits, and so on are all incredibly useful in understanding pathophysiology, but they're not really therapeutic testing models because they don't last long enough, they're very hard to breed, they're very expensive. In contrast, our 508 uh, gene edited rat, and we also uh, serendipitously got a knockout line at the same time, uh, have been breeding really nicely in Adelaide, and some of the details of their um, characterisation are shown here. And firstly, just to confirm, in nasal airway, we have uh, in the knockout lines and the 508 PDs that make sense, wild type, intermediate for 508, and lowest for knockout for mRNA, mRNA expression in the lung, a similar pattern. And more recently, we've been able to uh, measure 
small airway dysfunction using flex event uh, pulmonary function system in mice. And so that's a tissue, tissue damping parameter that we will now be able to use to test the effect of treatments. Control of vector delivery. I've actually got three slides on this, and I think that reflects the importance of vector delivery in how we proceed with uh, gene therapy in the lung generally and also in CF. There's probably three different methods, direct fluid installation, coarse sprays or aerosols. And together, they give us some options, but I think they're actually quite limited at the moment because of this issue of um, sufficient vector mass. Our vectors, um, we're using prodigious amounts of particles to get small amounts of gene expression, whether it's AAV or LV or adenovirus or whatever. We're not very effective at this and we need to get much, much better. Given that, that it's such a poor efficiency, having a wafer-thin aerosol would be a great way to dose and the simplest way to do it, but I don't think we're there yet. We need to use bulk vector fluid to have enough particles resident over the cells that we want to affect for long enough to get the job done. These are biological deliveries, not pharmacological. So I think we're nowhere near aerosols at this stage, uh, at, at least for lentivirus. Uh, residence time is also important. Um, we need to be able to keep the vector in the airway as long as possible so it can have its effect. And it might be that in mildly diseased uh, regions in CF, the balance between reduction of mucociliary clearance and not too much mucus uh, kept in place will give us some retention time there. But we need to wait and see that. And of course, there's retention agents that can be used. Are you right to push the first button there? We've also looked at um, vector delivery, and on the left here is some synchrotron X-ray imaging experiments to show what happens when you dose a mouse nose. And this is contrast agent being used as if it was a dose. And if you look on the left, that's a typical dose, four microliters used for LPC. On the right, 20 microliters for a vector. And you can see a four microliter dose stays in the nasal airway, but you can see over here a 20 microliter dose fills the nasal airway but also slops over and goes down into lung. So that explains that result we saw earlier on with the long-term luciferase. You push the second one too. If we go to the lung, there's two here. One here that's dosed the same as this one. This animal keeps breathing, that one doesn't. And so you can see it initially, in this case green, went through most of the lung. This one's working hard now just trying to get a breath going. And you can see the green start to come up there, we're getting some residence time there, and finally the breath goes out and it essentially explodes out through the whole lung. So right there we saw why we get such big change in what's going on in our gene expression in the lung. Because the animal's doing different things and we can't control it. We're using the lung as a black box and we're throwing a dose in and hoping it goes somewhere. So it really tells me that we don't really have any control of vector delivery uh, at, at a level that we need. So we went ahead and looked at how we could fix that and we've designed a system using a human salivary gland rigid bronchoscope. It's uh, in this case about 1.1 millimetre round and you can see here what's at the tip. There's a light source, a camera and two delivery channels which allow us to do things in the rat lung. It works very well and you can see here an example of giving one lobe uh, LV lac Z delivery and it stays in the lobe. So we're now at the point where we can, and could you push the second one, at uh, the bottom right. This is an example of how we do, or what you see when you go and do uh, bronchoscopy in a rat, going there past the larynx down into the trachea. And it's possible essentially to go down to the fourth or fifth generation in about a 200 gram rat. And obviously bigger animals you can go further. And here we're coming up to the carina and heading left on the screen but into the right lung and the right upper lobe is just there shown on the left and that's a, a typical easy place to place a dose of whatever we'd like to whether it's a gene vector or in fact we've done the same things as you'll see shortly with agar beads so we can as as you can see here in the application side of things use this process for specific targeted regional gene vector dosing or in fact for localized induction of disease so for CF, that could be staph or pseudomonas, either free or in beads. 
that can be given just to one small part of the lung, a particular lobe, it means our animals aren't going to be, get, be getting so incredibly sick that most of them die. It means the animal can take that infected area, we can go back and treat that infected area, and it's also now possible to do a couple of treatments or doses in different parts of a single animal lung. So I think there's a lot of opportunity coming here. And finally, the thing that really I think we've been missing in the lung field is a relevant outcome measure. We've been working for about 10 years with a group from Monash University and now a company 40X to develop X-ray velocimetry measures of airflow in lungs that are done by looking at lung motion using X-ray, not lung structure. And that's the key difference. There's a lot of advantages in only looking for motion. And one of them is that you don't have to use much X-ray. Not time to go through this here, but this gives you an example of what might be possible. This is a mouse lung that has been imaged prior to treatment with a bronchoscopically placed bolus of agar beads. And I believe it was about a 50 microliter bolus that went into the right upper lobe. It was clear in the post analysis that the airflow defect is apparent there as the blue no airflow area. So it's just an example of the sort of, uh, I guess, sensitivity and exquisite detail that's now going to be possible. We can quantify them, and this particular quantification looks at a heterogeneity scale. You can see it's really quite heterogeneous, but blue is what it looked like beforehand, a single peak, generally heterogeneous, but the second uh, line here in purple, is it, or red, shows a bimodal peak, and that shows that area of no airflow. So there's now a new capability commercially, a small animal scanner is available, it sits in your room, radiation enclosure, so you don't need special gear, or special rooms. There's human um, imaging going on at the moment, and it's an FDA approval process, and we're about to start large animal studies in Adelaide to look at sheep and pigs and use existing animal level fluoroscopy systems to do essentially the same uh, analyses. So the challenges that remain for CF lung gene therapy, as I've said, I think delivery is the big one right now. Getting to the correct region cells and using the right amount. We need to overcome the natural barriers just sufficient for therapy so that we still protect the lung but um, can get through those evolutionarily um, set in place barriers. There's also CF specific barriers and we know some parts of the CF lung won't be rescuable other parts will be, but prevention is really where we're trying to head to with pretty much worldwide um, early screening now available. We should be able to get to the point where we can prevent disease occurring if we can make gene addition therapy work. The use of airway conditioning I've noted here because I've talked earlier about the importance of airway conditioning. We've just finished studies in marmosets, uh, uh, two groups of six animals to look at do we actually need lung conditioning in, oh, sorry, airway conditioning in the lung? And I think if you look generally over here, on average, there is no difference between the level of luck expression here in these six, two groups of six animals, and this is um, shown better in the graph up here. Certainly it looks like, and we also have not shown, uh, I haven't got the data here, in mice, that we probably don't need to use conditioning to get good gene expression in lung at least acutely. What we don't have any information on is what's the situation here for long term and are we getting to stem cells or not. My, my uh, personal feeling is we will still need some level of conditioning, some level of access, physical access to airway stem cells to be able to get long term gene expression. But for systems not like CF, where you just want some short term delivery, the lentiviral um, system that we have seems to work very well either way. The final challenges, vector safety I think for lentes, uh, the oncogenic, oncogenic potential and replication competence issues don't appear to be there. We need to think about a plan B going into clinical trials because the first thing we're not going to do with a genome integrating vector is go to the whole lung and hope it all works well. So going bronchoscopically to a particular lobe that could be resectable if needed 
um, is probably a good way to start that. And that's part of what we're trying to replicate in our RAT model too, to test some of those approaches. What's the cost and the profit to drive investment for um, a single or a few dose treatment with a lifelong benefit? This is an issue that's um, come up at this meeting a number of times and I don't know that it's really solved and it's different for different countries. The US is very different to national health system countries. And durability, how long will it go? Is half a lifetime of gene expression a mouse 45 years in a human or one year in a human? We don't know that yet. There's also a worrying perception that I've come across in the medical profession outside respiratory and outside CF is that, well, the vertex modulators are here, we don't really have to try anymore. And we need to correct that. My last slide is really, I think, to think about where we are in this space. And you might have seen this before, but it's, uh, it comes from the Gartner Group, the top one, and it's been tied up with um, a different way of looking at technology uh, adoption. And certainly um, back, whoops, back here in the 90s when we're all starting in gene therapy, we had this technology come up and we had that really big peak of everything's going to be fixed in five years and then a massive crash and a trough of disillusionment. Many of us fell down this chasm, few of us kept going and then we're into the slope of enlightenment and we're obviously hopefully there for gene addition therapy um, starting with Lux Turner and some of the others now coming through in the pipeline. CF's going to be much harder um, but we're still a number of us working in there and I think we're probably about this point in the slope of enlightenment and I think this is a useful thing to now think about the same situation for gene editing. Where are we on the, on the scheme here? And so all of this work was done by the team, uh, an incredibly good group of uh, scientists in Adelaide, um, shown here in our lab in Adelaide and also at the Synchrotron in Japan. And thank you to our research partners who actually made this possible. Thanks very much. Questions for David? Hi, that was a lovely talk. Um, have you actually looked for the uh, VSVG receptor in the airways of your models? So in the airway? Yeah, and so when you're looking at LPC, your hypothesis is that the VSVG receptor goes to, uh, is below the basal lateral? Yes. It's okay. So have you actually identified the receptor, which I think is the LDL We receptor? haven't identified them, but it's apparently the LDL receptor. Yeah. Have you actually looked for that in your models? And I was thinking particularly in the marmoset as well. No, we haven't. Okay, so, but do you see any differences in the transduction of cells between the models, between the uh, mouse and the rat? In terms of number of basal versus others? Yeah. We haven't specifically looked at that. I'd say they're probably similar. It's, it's rare, you know, there's not many of them. Um, and that's very qualitative. No, we, we haven't quantified it though. David, I've got a question. In terms of, um, I was intrigued by what you said about the LPC pretreatment, in terms of um, not really seeing too much of a difference in transduction, but it could be that you need it for stem cells. Have you thought of um, prolonging the time of exposure between LPC and the lentivirus, or having repeated LPC administrations over a week or longer and then giving lentivirus? Yes, um, we had done a number of, uh, Trish had done a number of studies looking at what's the appropriate time between LPC and vector delivery. If you go too close to LPC, there's a, a great drop off in gene expression. So, and we, we see that as the LPC having a direct effect on the lentivirus, which is quite a fragile virus. If you go further out, then really what the peak of expression is about one hour and as you go longer it drops off. We have not directly looked at repeated LPC um, treatments and then uh, gene delivery but we have in, in a little bit in other ways where we've done repeated LPC, the standard ones, LPC plus vector, LPC plus vector in animals 
and that certainly still works, but that's at a week-long interval, that type of thing. It's a redosing approach, so we haven't really asked that question. And how reproducible is it between species? So uh, reproducible. So you've done a lot of work in mice, yep. and you've gone through to other species. Have you found that the amount of LPC preconditioning and timing is different between species? And how likely is that going to be translatable to a human? Yeah. We haven't specifically looked at whether we're at the optimal for each different species. We did a lot of work in the mice and we essentially transferred that to the different animal models. Given enough money and funding, we could go into those different animal models and say, well, is that the appropriate level? But we've not been able to do that. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, so, so the mice that were used um, at the very beginning of the talk, are, are those CF model or, or not? I'm trying to get at what impact does um, getting through the mucus uh, layers... Oh, sorry, normal, they're normal. Those are normal, right? Normal so the LPC doesn't order, actually order address the mucus. Yep. And then my follow-up question to that is, how material uh, do you... How material is... Um, I don't even know how to say this. Mucus uh, transit for AAV or lentiviral mediated uh, uh, therapy platforms today? Like how close are we to solving that problem? In terms of uh, overcoming the mucus barrier? Yeah, 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 especially in, in CF mucus, not mucus mucus, yeah, CF, CF mucus. mucus. Yeah. I don't think we're close to it. Nowhere near. I don't, I don't think so. And partly that's because of our, our animal models. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Obviously, the CF mouse really doesn't yeah. have a mucus issue. Right. And then the ferret and the sheep and monkey, those are also normal animals, right? Not the CF ferrets? The monkey is normal, yes. Uh, the sheep the is normal and, and the, the ferret's normal. Oh, everything's normal. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. So they're reported gene studies. Right. Yes. And the number of effective integration in basal cells this could be approached by analyzing the sites of integration. Analyzing, sorry? The sites of integration of the vector. Uh, if you know where so the vector so integrates, so yep. then you know how many events you have. And, and then you have, have, have you considered doing that? Yes, we have those studies underway, but I don't have any data. Sorry. Any other questions? Okay, if not, um, on behalf of uh, Pat and I, I'd like to thank the speakers for a great symposium and thank you for uh, attending our symposium. Thank you.